Welcome, I'm Ryan Holger with Temperature Equipment Corporation. Uh, this week's webinar is duct sealing and testing. Uh, we will talk about it from both a residential and a commercial perspective and try to answer any questions anybody has in regards to code compliance, um, sealing methods, testing methods, uh, and like, rebates and those kind of things. All right, so most of you guys probably have seen me use this slide a few times. It's just to let you know that we're energy pigs in this country. I'm not going to read it to you or go into detail. I think most of you guys get it by now. We use a lot of energy in the United States, and we use a lot of it for building-related stuff. So buildings are 40% of the total energy consumption of the entire country. If you look at it, depending on whose stats you look at, it's anywhere, we'll just call it a third, a third to 40% um, is, is buildings both residential and commercial, another third is ind industry, and another third is transportation. If you look specifically at the building section, you can see about a quarter of that is related to space heating, another 10, 15% for cooling, another three, four, five percent for ventilation. So a good third of the building energy we can affect with the HVAC system. Depending on whether it's residential or commercial, that does change a little bit. Uh, on the residential side, we can typically affect well more than half uh, because the heating is such a big need uh, nationwide. And here in the Midwest, where most of us are at, heating is an even bigger portion than the 40% we're showing here. All right, point is we use a lot of energy, and a good chunk of that goes towards heating and cooling systems, so we should be able to, to help fix some of that stuff with improved equipment, or in today's case, improved duct distribution systems. So looking at things residentially for a minute, uh, there's... 89 million houses that have ducted systems in their homes. Most houses have ducted systems. I realize there's some with hydronic systems and there's some with duct-free splits, but the vast majority of us have ducted systems in our houses, and the vast majority of those leak, and they leak a lot. Um, even new systems often leak a lot. Uh, so depending on whose stats you look at, Department of Energy, uh, EPA, AeroSeal, Whoever your data you're looking at will give you a little bit of variance, but 20 to 40 percent is typically the number you'll see for most of those little studies uh, of conditioned air leaking out of the ductwork, right? So that's a third of your air is not even making it to the grills, registers, and diffusers. It's leaking out into the ductwork, going who knows where. It's not a, just an age house thing. Obviously, older houses on average are worse off than newer houses on average. But I've been to plenty of new construction houses, even in the past year, new construction houses, that are leaking well more than 50% of their air. So don't assume that because you have a new system that everything's working fine, you may be wasting quite a bit. Uh, specifically, duct leakage uh, accounts for about $25 billion in wasted energy use annually. Now, we can't make all the ducts perfectly tight and save all $25 billion, but maybe we could save half of the billion, half the $25 billion. Um, maybe we can get some improvement there. Uh, home, homes use uh, quite a bit of that energy. Um, now it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. Um, so reasons that we might want to seal duct systems other than code compliance, which we'll talk about in a little bit here, is uh, primarily for improved comfort, uh, especially residentially. Um, getting the right air into the correct room is a big deal, especially when you have multi-story homes all being served by one furnace and, and one thermostat. To get the right air to the right room is, uh, is pretty important. And if air is leaking into the wall cavities, the attic, into the unconditioned basement, it's not getting into the rooms that you need it in. Uh, there's also a health benefit. If my ductwork is leaking on the supply side, pretty good chance it's probably leaking on the return side as well. And then we're sucking in stuff into the ductwork because the return side of the system is the negative pressure. So we're sucking crap in from your attic, like fiberglass insulation, or sucking crap in from your crawl space, like mold, and that stuff then gets circulated around your house so your whole family can enjoy it and, and breathe those harmful things. Uh, additionally, don't assume that just the return duct is the one that's sucking things in. Sometimes supply ducts, even though they're positively pressurized, can also suck things in. Uh, they can create like a vacuum effect and they can entrain air into some of the cracks, even though they may be leaking out of other cracks. Uh, and you can suck stuff in on both duct systems and then distribute it around your home. Uh, another reason to to think about it is the energy savings. Um, the bigger the system, the higher the static pressure of the fan, the better the energy savings story gets. So commercially, duct sealing can be huge dollars of energy savings. I'm not saying you don't save energy residentially because you certainly do. It's just not orders of magnitude, you know, crazy. It's not thousands of dollars. It's hundreds of dollars residentially. Um, but 
I would say residentially, comfort is the big driver, energy savings is a bonus, and then commercially, energy savings is the driver, and comfort for the occupants is a bonus. If anybody has any questions as we're going, um, if you could type them in that question chat box, and then that at the uh, at the quiz poll breaks, I will try to read through them and answer them for you guys. Um, Department of Energy has similar uh, statements to the EPA and other groups. Uh, duct systems losing 25 to 40 percent of their heating and cooling energy output. Right, so if you got a, for sake of argument, a 10 ton rooftop, four tons could potentially be not being used by your building and leaking to places that you don't care about. Right, so you're putting in a 10 ton system to get six tons worth of effective cooling. Right, that's a pretty common common problem. Luckily, we oversize everything in our industry, grossly oversize it, right? So no problems there. That's my sarcasm, if you can't tell over the uh, webinar. So if only half the typical loss of these uninsulated and unsealed ducts were saved, it would be about 160 bucks in a house, um, average nationwide. Uh, the bigger the temperature difference between indoors and outdoors in the home, i.e. the Midwest climate, the bigger the dollar amounts can get. And obviously, the higher your utility costs, the bigger the dollar amounts can get. Uh, I'm going to show you one more study, and then we'll change gears a little bit. Uh, the study is a few years old here, um, McKinsey study. This is residentially orientated. Um, ceiling ducts is the biggest single individual factor for improving energy efficiency in a residential home nationwide. Right? It's even more important than putting in a high-efficiency furnace. Right? And that's number three, upgrade your heating equipment. Go from that 80% furnace or boiler to the 95%, right? and you're going to save basically 15% energy. Well, 16%, but most people don't like math, so we'll say 15, right? Duct ceiling is a much bigger, much bigger driver, uh, especially if your duct work is outside the conditioned envelope at any point in time. It, it, it's, it's a bigger factor than programmable thermostats. It, it's definitely bigger than the windows that end user customers always think is the solution, right? Their house is cold and drafty or the energy bills are high. Oh, we better get new windows, right? Windows are not very uh, energy efficient. Even when you get the really good ones, it's not a big, it's not a big driver. Um, so ceiling ductworks is the major factor there. That same study looked at things a little bit different way. And which of these things that were on that list were most cost beneficial, right? So which ones gave me the biggest dollar savings, um, or well, yeah, dollars or energy savings for my dollar spent to implement? What's the most cost effective ones to do, right? So you can see down there, Third from the bottom, duct sealing was the least costly thing to do per energy unit saved, right? So programmable thermostat was the cheapest thing you could do, right? Insulating your basement was the next, then sealing your duct work, right? And then insulating your attic. By the way, everybody insulates their attic, right? Um, insulating your attic, if I go back one screen, is down in the middle of the list in terms of its energy saving potential. And then it's kind of, you know, in the lower pricing range as well. But duct sealing beats it in both cases. So duct sealing, on average, is a better deal than insulating your attic. I'm not saying don't insulate your attic. I'm just saying while you're up there, seal your ducts, right? Uh, looking at some of the questions real quick, uh, Fazil asks about uh, code requirements to seal low-pressure ductwork. I will go over that in a couple minutes. Um, and then Janet asks on that McKinsey study, uh, sealing ducts stat is number one. Does that depend on how much is outside of the envelope? Uh, yes. So it does, and that is an average. So some of the projects in these studies, and this is this is meant to be uh, analyzing projects and then extrapolating that over all of the homes nationwide, right? To try to figure out the, the total energy saving potential is for the country, right? So this would include both ductwork inside and outside the envelope for this particular study, right? So some of those are making it a really good story. Some of those are making it a little bit of a less story. All right, we'll keep moving on here. Um, so that's the two of them side by side, right? Energy saving potential, duct ceiling's number one. The best thing per your dollar spent, it's number four off the bottom of the list there, right? So it's it's up there. All right, let me go ahead and launch the first poll question, if I can figure out how to do that right now. All right, remember, you need to answer the poll questions, especially if you're getting PDH credit. Otherwise, you won't get PDH credit. All right, so that's our first poll question. Um, what portion of the conditioned air commonly leaks from the ducts, right? Is it A, B, or C, less than 10%, 20 to 40%, 50 to 70%, or more than 75% of the duct work? So 
Look, about 73% of you voted. I'll give it a little bit more here. And I'll close it in five, four, three, two, one. All right, looks like the vast majority of you guys got the correct answer, which is impressive because I did say it six minutes ago, so I am impressed. The correct answer is B, 94% of you said that. 20 to 40% of the conditioned air is likely leaking out of the ductwork system. All right, we should be back to my regular screen here. Like I said, type questions in as we go if you could. All right, in regards to code, um, mainly focusing on Illinois because the vast majority of the login attendees are from Illinois. Um, the code in Illinois is the International Energy Conservation Code 2012, and that went into effect January 2013, which is almost two years ago now. For those of you in other states, don't worry, it's coming your way. It always does, right? Maybe you're a year or two behind some states, but everybody eventually gets there for the most part. Unless you're Wyoming, then you don't care about codes. Uh, but this is the residential story right here. I'll show you commercial in, in a minute. Uh, as you're probably aware, and you've probably seen this chart before, uh, over the time, over the years, the codes get more and more stringent, right? So even more recently, from 2006 to 2009, a 15% bump in stringency. From 2009 to 2012, another 15% bump, right? And the same thing's going to happen in 2015, right? The goal is that by the year 2030, we don't spend any energy as a country. I'm chuckling under my breath, but that's kind of our, our goal, right? So residentially, here's what you have to do in the state of Illinois. And by the way, this is the energy code for the entire state. I realize certain cities are not, how would you say, enforcing it correctly or properly, but it is the code for the state. So even if your city is not enforcing it yet, it doesn't matter. It's still the code. If you do something that's not, if you do something against the code, even though you didn't get caught on it, that doesn't mean you're, you're, you're free and clear from being sued and all of that. Now, I hope you're not going to get sued for an energy code violation like you would for a safety thing, but hey, you never know. You have to comply with the state code, even if your town is not forcing it down your throat. All right, so I'm going to skip the uh, insulation stuff in the code because that's a different topic for a different day, but you do have to insulate ducts as well. Uh, requirements right there, 403.2.2, sealing, mandatory. Mandatory, as you probably would guess, means you have to do it. You have to seal the ducts, the air handler, the filter boxes, pretty much everything that moves air through it, right? So you have to seal everything. There are some, you know, uh, exceptions to that, um, continuously welded things. Okay, if it's welded, it's already sealed, right? Um, so there are some exceptions to that. But generally speaking, seal the ducts, seal the air handler, and seal the filter boxes. Now, it used to be that with these codes, they told you you had to seal it, you went in there and put some tape and mastic on it. The inspector walked in and saw that you did that. He said, good job. Everyone was happy, and your life moved on. Well, now, the 2012 version, not only do you have to seal it, you may also have to test it to a certain leakage amount. And if you don't hit the leakage amount, in those cases, then you have to continue sealing it until you get down. The leakage amount is very, very, very low. It is based on the square foot of the conditioned floor area of the home. Right, so it's either 4 CFM of leakage allowed per 100 square feet or it's 3 CFM of leakage allowed per 100 square feet. And the difference is depending on whether the air handler or the furnace is installed when you are doing the testing or not. Right, so you get a little bit more leeway. You get the 4 CFM uh, per 100 square feet instead of the 3 if your air handler is physically uh, there because your air handler has a little bit of leakage in, it, in and of itself. Right, so if you have a 1,000 square foot home, that means you're getting what? You're getting 30 to 40 CFM total allowance of leakage. That's not very much. That's a very tiny amount and very difficult to get. The exception to having to do this duct leakage test is that if your duct work and your air handlers and every single piece of equipment involved in the air distribution system is entirely within inside the thermal envelope, right? So if everything's inside that envelope of the house, meaning that it's on the interior side of the insulation and air sealing of the home, then you can go ahead and not seal the, you can not, you can then go ahead and not have to test the ductwork. You still have to seal it, but you don't necessarily have to test it. If one part of that ductwork goes outside the envelope, you have one little jumper duct or whatever that jumps through the attic, now you got to pressure test the whole duct system. 
So for those of you involved in new construction, you'd be wise to start talking to architects into building a room around your mechanical equipment and duct systems in the attic. Or just start sealing the attic at the, at the uh, roof line instead of at the ceiling line. Um, and you might be able to avoid having to do the testing portion of this. Plus, you'll probably save more energy overall. Uh, Mark types in a question, is Chicago Energy Code stricter than IECC? Uh, I would say typically not, at least right now we're talking about residential, and I would say the state code is more strict than the Chicago code. In the Chicago code, they should be enforcing the state, but some of the inspectors are choosing to enforce the old Chicago code. There's a little bit of an issue there in terms of who's doing what. Um, Fazil asked about smacking the duct ceiling pressure classes. We will talk about that in a second. Um, Andy, I don't understand your question, so I have to call me later uh, about insulating the basement, including box ceiling. I'm not sure what box ceiling means. All right, on the commercial side, similar story. Energy codes get stricter and stricter every year. We are also on the International Energy Conservation Code 2012 here in the state of Illinois, uh, and there are some requirements related to duct ceiling in that case. Um, so the first part is on insulation here, so we'll skip that for today's purposes down towards the bottom. All ducts and air handlers and filter boxes shall be sealed. Joints and seams shall comply with, and with Section 603.9 of the International Mechanical Code. You have to seal all of your ductwork, both residentially and commercially. Regardless of whether it's inside or outside the envelope, you have to seal it. Right? Testing depends on your scenario. Right? So residentially, you have to test if it's outside the envelope at any point. Commercially, I'll show you here when you have to test it. Right? So commercially, they divide things typically into low, medium, and high pressure systems. Right, so for low pressure systems like we're talking about on the screen right now, it's telling you that that's two inches of water column or less, right, and that everything has to be sealed, and you can your choice of using welds, gastics, adhesives, you know, like mastic um, or uh, or tape. Um, it doesn't say you have to use UL tape, but most inspectors are probably going to make you do it that way because that's generally the right way to do it because the UL tape can handle the expansion uh, of the heating and cooling. Uh, the exception to not having to do the sealing, once again, is continuously welded joints. Obviously, that makes sense. If it's welded, it's pretty much sealed forever. Um, so that, just keep that in mind. Uh, on the medium and high pressure stuff, medium pressure is basically similar to the, to the low pressure requirements. Medium pressure means two to three inches, and you have to seal the ductwork there as well. The high pressure stuff is three inches and above, and you also have to seal all the ductwork there. Um, the difference is with three inches and above, you will be required to do some testing of the duct leakage. All right, so if you read there, in addition, ducts and plumbs shall be leak tested in accordance with SMACNA HVAC Air Duct Leakage Test Manual. Um, so that's the difference. Re residentially, you have to test it when it's outside the envelope. Commercially, you have to test it if it's above three inches. In all cases, you actually have to seal it. Uh, Joe is typing in a question if the state's on cycle for IECC 2015. Yes, with the last code cycle, instead of forcing all the congressmen to put a law in to change it every three years, uh, they put in rules to automatically update it. So there's no longer any influence from the congressmen and representatives from the state. It's already automatically going to update. Now, there's certain state departments that have to approve it on that process, but there's no one that has to submit a bill like we used to have to do uh, in, in 10 years ago, right? So yes, it's likely that 2015 will go forward. I would suspect if you force me to guess that it will be enforced starting in January 2016 would be my guess. Uh, Larry's asking, if you replace an air handler in an existing building that high pressure ductwork system has, do you have to test it over three inches? That's a good question and that's going to probably be up to your individual inspector on what they choose to enforce. But in general, the International Energy Conservation Code applies equally to new construction, repairs, replacements, renovation work, additions, alterations. It applies to everything. So generally what most towns do, most inspectors will do, is if you touch something, the new thing you touched has to be compliant with the code. Right? So for example, if I take a rooftop off of a roof and it had no economizer and I put a new one on and the new code requires an economizer, I got to put an economizer on it. I don't have to change my duct system because I did that, but I have to put an economizer on it. I would suspect that if you change out your air, hand, air, air handler, like you're asking, on a three-inch static pressure system or higher, and all you did was change the air handler, you did not touch the duct system, my guess is they would not force you to test the duct system. They may force you to test the air handler leakage, 
but not the duct system because it's already there and in place. But each town might choose to enforce things a little bit differently. That's generally how it goes. All right, so the takeaway here is if you can get things designed under three inches of static, you should try to do that. I know that's not always possible due to existing conditions or if you got certain laboratories or things like that, but most buildings can be designed under three inches of static. Most, you know, commercial like office buildings and schools and stuff like that. So in Larry's case, if he's got a three inch air handler at a school, for example, maybe the new air handler can be designed a little bit differently so it's a 2.8 inch air handler of static or something like that. Um, some of the uh, other things that might be involved, like ASHRAE standards or uh, SMACNA standards in addition to the IECC, um, these things kind of get dumped into categories. So based on the uh, pressures of your system, you typically get, get lumped into a certain category. So in ASHRAE, typically the way it's done is an a, B or, or a, B or C category and depends on the type of system you have, supply, exhaust, return, or indoor, outdoor type space, uh, and static pressure might be involved. So basically, things that are located outside are likely to have bigger requirements. Things that are higher pressure are likely to have bigger requirements because both of those two scenarios have bigger energy savings potential, right? Low pressure systems have lower requirements for ceiling and systems that are located in buildings have lower requirements. Uh, and then that ASHRAE one matches up pretty nicely with the SMACNA stuff. Um, there's, they use the same kind of thing, A, B, or C duct class. A is four inches above, C is two inches less, um, and then um, three inches B. So very similar to what the uh, state code requires. Um, and then they'll tell you specifically what you have to seal, right? So you have to seal just the transverse joints or that and the seams or that and the wall penetrations. All right, let's launch the next quiz question here. So we can keep on, on pace. So question number two. So per the IEC 2012, if the residential ductwork is all within the thermal envelope, then duct sealing is not required. True or false? If it's all in the envelope, then duct sealing is not required. Give it a few seconds here. Looks like most people have voted, so I'm gonna go ahead and close it in three, two, one. All right, looks like most people got that wrong. Perhaps I worded it in a tricky fashion here. Um, so if residentially, if the ductwork is inside the thermal envelope, then you do not have to do duct sealing. Right, so the answer would be true. So I, I think maybe I must have confused you guys with the wording. So just so everyone knows for their own project use, if you can get all the ductwork inside the envelope of the building, you do not have to test it. So hopefully I didn't confuse anybody with the way I worded that. Oh, I'm sorry, I could just confuse myself with the way I worded it. That's why you guys, okay, you guys all got it right. Uh, if all the ductwork is within the thermal envelope and duct sealing is not required. Duct sealing is still required. So you guys got it right when you said false. Duct duct testing is, is the one that would not be required. I'm sorry, I confused myself with my answer to my question. Uh, sorry about that. So false is the correct answer. That was a little embarrassing. All right. Let's go back. To the slides. All right, so common places that you'll find leakage that needs to be addressed, um, both commercially and residentially. Um, so joints are the big thing. Wherever you have two pieces of ductwork connecting, obviously that's where there's going to be a potential for leak. Some types of joints are significantly more leak prone than others. Um, so things to specifically pay attention to, uh, the traverse joints from duct to duct connections, from duct to branch connections, 
those places are, are typically common. Um, and also from ductwork to equipment uh, is pretty common as well. Um, the longitudinal seams aren't too bad usually, especially if you're using manufactured type ductwork. Uh, obviously, if you're using spiral type ductwork or, and round, then you're even in better shape because there's there's less, um, you know, field connections, if you will. Rectangular ductwork is typically field directed and might be slightly more problematic. Uh, Any type you got penetrations for, you know, actuator shafts, uh, pneumatic tubing, um, linkage arm rods, any of that kind of stuff, you're probably going to be more likely to have leakage. Um, Believe it or not, sometimes people run stuff through your ductwork they shouldn't. Someone decides, oh, it's a good idea to run the Ethernet cable through the ductwork. Right? When they make those penetrations for that little tiny cable, they cut a big one-inch hole. Those are huge leaking points. Obviously, not something you can control at the design phase, but certainly something you can look at in the field. Um, different types of connections um, leak better or more than others, but all types are going to leak. Um, the more interwoven the connection is, if you will. So like an S type connection, probably in most cases will leak a little bit less than the T type connection. Um, but in either case, they're all going to have some sort of sort of leakage. Um, obviously disconnected ductwork, like you see in the upper left hand corner, is going to leak. If you can see the hole, it's going to leak. The big one on residential stuff is the takeoffs, um, like we're showing in those other three pictures. Um, the typical takeoff for like a six inch um, a duct is to cut a six and a quarter inch hole, shove this six inch duct into it and bend these tabs out, right? And now everywhere these tabs bend, there's these little holes all the way around them as you can see in those three pictures. And there's a quite a bit of area that leaks out of those points. All right, so um, in addition to ceiling ducts, we also have to test them in some cases. Like we said, residentially, we're testing them whenever they're outside the envelope at any point in time thermal envelope, which would include an attic would count, a crawl space would count, an unconditioned basement would count. You'd have to test those systems. And then commercially, we're testing them when they're above three inches of static, typically, or sometimes less if the designer just wants us to test them. Right? In any case, to test them residentially or commercially, there's some specific types of equipment we're going to need to use. Um, so for basic residential testing, we need a blower with variable speed range. Uh, sometimes this is referred to as a duct blaster. A uh, duct blaster is a trademark term from one particular manufacturer, uh, but it's kind of used as the Kleenex type word, right? So in the picture here on the right, uh, the duct tester is that yellow and red box down there. Uh, on the inlet of that, you'll see those red collars. On the inlet of that yellow box, there's a, you can adjust which, which inlet collars you put on there to have a larger or smaller opening restriction uh, so you can handle smaller ranges of air flows with accurate measurement readings. I need something to do the measurement readings. Typically, that's me, my, my manometer. Uh, and in the case of residential system, most of those manometers are communicating over to that yellow duct testing box on the picture there. Um, so they have an Ethernet cable going between them, and there's some communication going between them. And then obviously, there's also the pneumatic tubing. And then sometimes you may have a smoke generator, which is that little black box on the floor there in the picture. Um, that's not needed for actually testing the duct for code purposes or anything like that. It's just beneficial if you're trying to figure out where the duct work leaking, so you can figure out where you still got to go back and seal. Uh, if you puff a little bit of smoke on the inlet of that fan and you're pressurizing the duct system, you can look to see where that smoke leaks out. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to start, you know, lighting cigarettes and holding them at the inlet. Typically, typically we're using a the theatrical style smoke generator, which is not going to be something that's very harmful. Like I mentioned, there's test rings you put on the inlet suction side of that, of that fan. Uh, there's different rings, and some manufacturers have different configurations. But basically what they're doing is restricting the inlet off more and more so I can use, use it for different size air flows, right? So in this particular manufacturer that I took the snapshot of, uh, an open configuration, which means no rings on it at all, can go up to about 1,500 CFM, which should be able to handle a good portion of residential systems. There are other fans you can use to handle higher air flows, obviously. And then if I have lower air flow systems, I can start putting rings on there to restrict it downward. The other thing I got to do to do the testing Right, so you saw over here I connected it to the, in this case, the furnace. I took the bottom door off the blower, and we connected the, the duct blaster or duct uh, pressurization fan to the, that inlet opening on the furnace, and that way we can pressurize both the supply and return duct simultaneously. Right, but in order to test it, i got to recognize the fact that, well, there's some openings on the duct system that are supposed to be there. 
right? So obviously I'm going to have quote unquote leakage coming out in my grills, registers, and diffusers. So I have to temporarily block them off because I don't care about that leakage. That leakage is supposed to happen. That leakage isn't called leakage. It's called my supply error or my return error. So I have to temporarily block those off. A common way to do that is with uh, duct mask, which is that clear tape you see in both of those pictures there, right? To block off those openings temporarily during the test. You also have to make sure you turn the furnace off. I know that sounds kind of stupid, right? But some people forget to do that kind of thing and he starts sealing up all these registers and then bad things happen, right? So you got to turn the furnace off, turn the thermostat off, turn the disconnect off, make sure that furnace doesn't kick on during these tests. We're not going to use the furnace blower to test the duct system. We're going to use that small yellow blower I showed you a second ago, right? So seal off all the intentional openings like um, supplies and grills, and then we can pressurize the duct and see where everything leaks out at. Technically, you can pressurize the duct or you can depressurize the duct. It doesn't really matter which one you do. There's pros and cons to it. The benefit of pressurizing it is that if I want to do that theatrical smoke thing to see where it's leaking out, I can do that. I just inject the smoke at the inlet of the fan and I see where it leaks out in the duct. If I depressurize the duct work, I can still get valid measurement readings, but I can't do any troubleshooting that way. So there is a pro and con to that. Um, you are doing the supply and return duct simultaneously. Some folks get confused by that. I'm not quite sure why. If the, if the supply fan is off in the air handler and I'm injecting into it, like I'm doing in that picture there, air will go both up into the supply duct, and in this case, left out the return duct, so it doesn't really make a difference. Um, so you can go, you can do both supply and return simultaneously. Additionally, if you have an outside air intake on that system, which is fairly common nowadays, to have a small six or eight inch round duct going from the outdoors over to the return duct of the, of the furnace, that would also be tested as part of the same process. Obviously, you have to go outside and block, block temporarily block that intake, but you would be testing supply, return, and outside air simultaneously. Uh, so interestingly enough, all these residential duct tests, um, whether it's for Energy Star or for Code or for certain utility programs, they're all done at 25 pascals of pressure, which is about a tenth of an inch of water column. I don't know why we have to do it in Pascals. I suppose there's two reasons. One, the people that invented this, uh, these programs, if you will, are not HVAC people, so they didn't talk about inches of water column. They used whatever measurements seemed logical to them, and Pascals have a much smaller range to them, so they're easier to talk about than talking about tenths of things. In any case, 25 Pascals is the pressure we test the residential duct systems at, and that's about a tenth of an inch of water column. You are testing all connections, supply, return, and outside. If you had an exhaust system attached to it, you would be testing that as well. Let me pull this open real quick here. Sorry, give me one second. Okay. All right, so there's two types of uh, duct testing you might do residentially. There's total leakage testing and then there's leakage testing to the outside. Um, total leakage testing is the more common test that we like to do. So you can see on that drawing there, I got my, my um, duct blaster fan that's connected to the inlet of my furnace. My furnace fan is off. It is supplying both positive pressure up into the supply duct into that attic and negative pressure down in the call space into that return. In this case, I'm pressurizing both of them simultaneously to 25 pascals. And I can use the manometer on my, on my fan to gauge the airflow that is being adjusted and get my readings that way. The other type of test is outside leakage test. This is not a code required test, but it can be beneficial if you're trying to calculate uh, energy savings, right? So in the total leakage test, it's just how much is my ductwork leaking? I don't care right now if it's leaking inside the house, outside the house. I just want to know all the leakage all together. But if at some point in time I said, you know what, that's nice info, but I want to know how much is leaking to the outdoors, meaning how much is going into the attic and the crawl space, what I need to do is remove the amount of leakage that I have going into the actual home. So you would do this with, with a duct blast test in conjunction with a whole house blower door test, which I'm showing over there on the left-hand side. I would have to pressurize the house to neutralize the pressure so any leakage that was happening inside the house would no, would no longer happening. Because if the pressure inside the duct is 25 pascals and the pressure outside the duct inside the house is 25 pascals, no air would leak into the house. And I only would be measuring leakage in the attic and in the crawl space where there was no positive pressure. All right, so that's not typically the test we do for code, but that is a test that can be useful if you're trying to figure out how much is outside versus inside. 
commercially, things are very similar in how we might test ductwork. Um, I need to be able to pressurize the ductwork. I need to have some kind of blower that has variable capacity on it so I can adjust that up and down. I need to have devices to measure the air flows and pressures, right? So it may not be the same manometers and same blowers that I'm using residentially, but it's going to be something similar with a higher range and perhaps even slightly more accurate probe materials. Uh, but I'm going to do the same thing, pressurize the duct, measure the flows and or pressures. If I measurize the pressures, I can calculate the flows. Um, and then I may or may not also choose to use a smoke, smoke generator to then see where the leakage is at. Um, whether it's residentially or commercially, a lot of the gauges and meters involved here might help you with the test. This is from a commercial meter uh, where I tell it the surface area of ductwork that I have. Right, so residentially, it's based on square footage of home. Commercially, it's typically based on surface area of ductwork, so two different types of tests. If I tell it that type of information, what class of ductwork I have, right, and then it'll actually tell me if I pass or fail. In this particular case, it had failed. Uh, back one slide here. Uh, Andrew is asking, how can you assume the attic and crawl space are sealed to the rest of the house. If not, it'll also be 25 pascals. If the attic and crawl space uh, are interconnected to the house because there's significant leakage between the two, which is fairly common, Andrew, uh, and my, my attic was completely sealed to the outdoors, then what you're saying is correct. It would also be at 25 pascals. However, in both of these examples, uh, you'll see on the notes there, assuming that it's a quote-unquote well-vented attic or quote-unquote well-vented crawl space, Right, so if I have a completely sealed attic with no venting on it, which is a horrible idea for a design purpose, then I would not be able to do the test this way. But if my attic is vented and I got ridge vents along the roof, then the pressure inside my attic is equal to or very ne nearly equal to the atmospheric pressure. Hopefully that answers it, Andrew. All right, let's launch poll question number three. Poll question number three. All right, to test leakage, you must A, temporarily block off all intentional openings, B, pressurize or depressurize the duct system, C, turn the furnace fan on, D, both A and B, or E, all of the above. By the way, while you guys are answering that, in regards to that last poll question, the true-false one, where I, where I uh, craftily worded it so both you and I were confused, uh, in terms of PDHs, I'm going to remove that question from the analysis. So when it spits out the report, that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't get accounted for. Because if I confuse myself with the way I worded it, I'm sure I confused a good portion of you. So just for the record, that will be removed from the analysis before the report spits out and they generate your certificates. So, but all the other questions will hopefully be not confusing. All right, 80% of you voted, so I'm going to give it 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I'm going to close the poll. All right, looks like most of you guys all got it correctly. 91% of you said it is D, which is both A and B. you got to block off all the intentional openings, like supplies and uh, registers, and you have to either pressurize or depressurize the duct. You do not turn the furnace fan on, so E would be wrong and C would be wrong answers. You do not turn the furnace fan on, that fan stays off, and you use a separate independent fan to test the duct pressure. All right. All right, so some common methods of sealing duct systems. I uh, Most of you guys are probably familiar with some of these. Um, so we can use metal tape, um, preferably UL listed metal tape, um, UL 181 type tape. I know you can buy other cheaper tapes, um, but some municipalities will not allow them because, well, primarily because they break down faster. And that is a problem with tape in general. Over time, being heated up and cooled down, that adhesiveness to it does break down, and it'll start pulling off the ductwork. Um, I'm sure all you guys have put metal tape on a, a furnace uh, inducer exhaust uh, duct, and two years later, it crumbled off and fell on your floor. Right? It's pretty common. That's a higher temperature. But even regular duct work where I'm heating and cooling it, heating and cooling it, it'll expand and contract the adhesive at a different rate, and it'll eventually get brittle and it'll dry out and break and fall off. Um, so use UL tape if you're going to use tape, and also keep in mind tape is the least permanent of all these solutions. 
You can use Mastic, which is what we're showing, and tape is the bottom left-hand pitcher there. Uh, Mastic is the top right three pitchers. Uh, Mastic is basically like paint, right, as far as what it looks like and how you apply it. Now, in reality, it's an adhesive, so it adheres and, and, and actually seals up. It does a good job of it. But it, it looks like a paint when you, when you have it applied on the ductwork. There's welding, which is the bottom right-hand corner of the pitcher. Welding is obviously a very tight way to do things, and you can probably get down to zero leakage unless you have a really bad welder. Um, the problem with welding is it's pretty expensive. So we're not going to do that on a residence or on a low-pressure commercial system. But if I have, you know, you know, critical systems, or if I have something that's uh, like a commercial kitchen or exhaust system, I'm probably going to have that welded. Uh, I can use gasketing. I wouldn't use this probably at every single duct connection, but in between duct connections and air handlers and stuff like that, things you, that you may want to remove at some point. Uh, gasketing is better because it's a, it's a temporary temporary permanent seal, if that makes sense. Right, I can open it and close it, um, but it still can be permanently closed during operation. So like air handler doors and stuff like that, gasketing is the way to go. I want to be able to open the door. I don't want to weld the door shut. I don't want to tape the door shut. I want to have a gasketed door that I can push shut turn a knob that then tightens it up and, and presses that gasket down. And then we can do aero seal, which some of you may have heard of. Aero seal is a trademark term. Uh, it's kind of like the Kleenex name again uh, for aerosol based sealing. So aerosol based sealing, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, you're basically misting a sealant down the duct and it is filling the cracks up from the inside out. Uh, so some pictures of it being applied in the field on the left is an aero seal machine. Uh, where they're injecting sealant into a duct system for sealing it in a commercial building. Uh, you can also do it residentially. Uh, the bottom left is obviously welding ductwork, uh, which it's expensive, um, but is a very tight seal. Uh, and, the, and the two on the right side are both uh, mastic applications. Um, a lot of people will wear a glove when they put the mastic on. That way they can ensure they're getting the material into the cracks. Um, you can also use paintbrushes to apply it. I would tell you that if you're going to do a paintbrush with mastic, Trim the paintbrush down so it's a real short, stubby brush. Um, the problem with mastic, the way it's typically applied by people that don't know how to apply it, is they're basically taking a paintbrush and they're painting it over the top of the crack, which does nothing to actually seal the crack. In order to seal it, you got to shove the crap into the hole, right? So you actually have to get the little short, stubby brush so you can angularly push it into the cracks. So just painting over the top of the crack does nothing. You have to push it into all the holes, into the cracks of the seams. So doing it with a glove is easier because you can feel with your hands that you're actually doing it the right way. Uh, mastic can be a bit messy, but it is an effective sealing method, uh, and it is commonly used residentially. In regardless of which sealing method you choose, mastic, tape, um, et cetera, don't forget certain things, right? So the two big things that people tend to forget when they're sealing duct systems is they forget about the air handler, whether it's an air handler or a fan coil or a furnace or whatever it is. Um, they forget about that air handler. That air handler needs to be sealed as well. It is going to be part of the leakage test, right? So make sure you seal that air handler and the connections of the ductwork to the air handler. You're not just sealing the ductwork. You're sealing the whole ducting system, which includes the air handler. The other one that's a very common um, missed point, especially residentially, is the floor boot diffuser. It's connection to the actual floor, right? So the, on the right-hand drawing here, we're showing that caulk gun sealing that boot diffuser to the floor, right, and then putting the register in on top of that. What happens is if you don't seal that, air comes up the duct system. Even if you had a perfectly sealed duct system, it comes up the duct system, it goes against that register where it gets some slight resistance, so some of the air turns to the sides and goes out the crack between the boot diffuser and the floor, and then goes into the floor cavity. And then you're paying to heat your floor cavity for no reason whatsoever. Uh, it is it is quite a large amount. When I sealed the duct system at my house about a year and a half ago, we actually measured that leakage in addition to the duct leakage itself. And I forget the exact number, but it was almost about 200 CFM more leakage in my residential house. So I'll show you a report from my house later, and I'll mention that again. But it's like an extra 200 CFM of leakage just in my house going out the boot diffusers. So it's a big amount. So don't forget those two things. Seal the air handler and seal the boot diffusers. Uh, John's asking if F FSK is okay for duckboard. Uh, I don't know what FSK is, and I don't do much with duckboard, so we don't really use that here in Illinois too much. But if you want to send me a note later, John, explaining what FSK is, I'll try to get the answer for you. Uh, and then another sealing type would be AeroSeal. And then, obviously, in terms of full disclosure here, 
at TEC, we have a lot of dealers we work with that do aero seal systems. Um, so just we're slightly biased because we like this system, but nonetheless. Uh, and I am also a trainer for aero seal here in the Midwest, so I'm reasonably familiar with it and go out in the field and help teach guys how to use it. Uh, but basically the idea here is uh, I'm going to seal up all of your intentional openings. So supply and grill, grill registers and those kind of things. I'm going to pressurize your duct system just like I was doing for the duct test. But while I'm doing that duct test, I'm going to mist in an aerosol-based sealant that's going to travel into your duct system and look for cracks to go out. Right. So I'm going to block off all your supply registers and grills just like I do for a duct test. Right. But I'm also going to test that like I did on a duct test. In this case, I'm doing it with a computer, but no different if I did it with a hand manometer. And I'm going to plug up all these registers with foam blocks. The purpose of the foam blocks is to make it impossible for air to leak out of the duct into the house, right, or into the building for that matter. Once I do that, I can start injecting sealant into the duct. And then as I pressurize the duct, there's only one place for the sealant to go. If I block off the registers and I block off your evaporator coil, which we will do here in a second, the only place for it to go is out the duct. So you can see on the left there, there's a guy putting another one of those foam blocks in over above the evaporator coil. And they're going to hook up this machine to this duct. And they're going to start injecting sealant into the duct. And basically what it looks like, um, when you look in the bottom two right pictures there, uh, one of them is a corner, one of them is a longitudinal seam. And you'll see that little white material on there. It looks like glue. Because that's basically what it is. Um, I, I don't know any better way to describe AeroSeal than it's basically like Elmer's glue in a spray bottle. Um, that's basically what it does. It does not really adhere to the inside surfaces of the duct system. Uh, it's basically traveling at a reasonably high velocity when you pressurize the duct, so it doesn't really stick to the surfaces. But then as it exit out, exits out a crack, when I go from the high pressure duct to the low pressure home, as it goes out of crack, that, that, that dynamic changes, and it actually can slow down enough that it can, can adhere to the side of the crack. And a little tiny glue ball will stick on the crack. And the next little glue ball sticks to him, and the next one sticks to him, and the next one sticks to him until it basically scabs over. Um, and that's kind of a disgusting way to describe it, but when you get a cut on your arm, you'll see the blood start clotting on the outsides of the cut first, and the clot starts closing itself together. It's exactly what this does for your duct work. It seals it from the inside out, just like blood would seal your cut wound open from the inside out. Uh, Jennifer asks if there's other AeroSeal, quote-unquote, type manufacturers out there. AeroSeal is the only one I'm aware of that does an aerosol-based solution. It is a Department of Energy technology, and they hold the patent on it. But AeroSeal is a company that has licensed the patent from the Department of Energy, so they can market systems to do what the technology is that the department developed. And they developed that technology 20-plus years ago. Um, I suppose someone else could, could go apply to get a license as well. I don't know how that all works, but I'm not aware of anybody that has. There are other systems that try to seal the the ductwork from the inside out, but they do not do it with a pressurized aerosol. Uh, I think they, most of them do it with like a little little robot that drives down the duct and then sprays like with a, like with a, like with a spray paint can, tries to spray the inside of your entire duct, which is a little bit different type thing there. Um, Larry asked the typical cost to seal an aero house with aero seal. Um, I don't know exactly on all the costs. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess a number, but that doesn't mean you should call an aerosol dealer and say, Ryan said that number. But my guess is here in the Chicagoland area, from people that I've heard, it's basically for a normal house, 1800 bucks to 2500 bucks, depending on the size of your house and stuff like that. Um, I suppose if somebody has a really small duct system or somebody has five furnaces in their house, uh, those numbers you know, could change, but that just gives you a kind of a, a guesstimate there. Uh, Daniel asks if aerosol, quote-unquote, glue is low VOC. Yes, it is low VOC um, specifically. And then part two to his question is, would it comply with lead low VOC requirements? That I don't know. We have to research that, Dan. If you could send me a note later, um, then I can get you specs. I'll get you the MSDS sheets on it, and we can see if it complies with whatever requirement you're trying to hit. Um, Sam asks, if the pressure drop at the coil, plug the coil with sealant. Yes, Sam, it would, which is why we actually block off the coil as well. You might have typed the question in before I showed you the slide, but over here on the left, this guy's taking that foam block. He's going to put that in flat above the evaporator coil and, and snugly. Snugly is a word, I suppose. So that way, when I pressurize this duct system, air cannot travel back downward into the coil. And when I do the return side of the system, we'll do the same thing. We'll block it off at the filter cabinet, 
so air cannot travel into the blower and heat exchanger and evaporator coil. So you can seal all the ductwork with this, but you cannot seal the air handler with this. Um, okay, I think I got all those questions answered. If not, ask them again. I'll continue on here. All right, so just giving you kind of a before and after of what, what it might look like. So on the left over here, this is a commercial duct. You see that hole in the corner over there? It's extremely common that on corners of connection points, all four corners typically have holes in them, and that's typically a pretty big leak point. Obviously, if you can seal that stuff, you might just go ahead and caulk it or whatever, um, but you may not know. You may not know it's there, and it may be happening throughout your entire system, and it may be behind the walls that are closed up already. So sealing from the inside out means I don't have to take walls down to seal ductwork. On the right hand, the picture shows what that sealant looks like as it filled in that crack. You do see a little bit. Let me see if I can get my little, uh, my little spotlighter here. Over here, my red spotlight is you do see a little bit of that uh, glue that built up on that edge over there because there is a slight crack there. But if you look at other spots over here in the top or over on the left, you don't really see any, any glue really built up. Only at points where the pressure change happens will you see glue material ad adhering to stuff. So it's going to basically be isolated to, to joints and cracks. Once that whole ceiling is done, whether it's a house or a commercial building, uh, what will then happen at that point in time is we'll do the duct test again, right, to see what the before and after is of the duct leakage. Um, so that's pretty much how that works. Uh, for a house, the actual ceiling time is probably usually 45 minutes to an hour and a half. Now there's a couple hours of prep and a couple hours of cleanup time, right, so it you know, ends up being, you know, six to seven, eight hour type thing. But the actual ceiling time is, is actually pretty quick. Uh, and then you remove all the plugs from the registers and evaporators. And then you close up, in this case, that hole where you made there to put the plug in and injection of the machine. That then gets sealed up by hand because you can't seal it from the inside out once the machine is disconnected. But you repair all that stuff. All right, let's look at poll question number four. All right, applicable duct sealing methods typically include A, metal tape, B, mask tape, C, aero seal, D, welding, E, mastic adhesive. And you can check all that apply. I don't know if you saw that on the question there. So you can check more than one. And by the way, you should check more than one. I'll go through and see if I missed any other questions while you guys are doing that question. Uh, Dan asks... Uh, how does the aero seal flow down to the far end of the duct system if the registers are blanked off? That's a great question, Dan. So what actually happens is, as long as there is a pressure difference, air will move, as I'm sure you're probably aware. Because there are holes and leaks in the duct, that means the pressure in the duct is higher than outside the duct, so air will continue moving down the duct and leaking out the cracks. Now, as the cracks start sealing off more and more and more, less and less air is going to be able to move to the duct system, until eventually we can't move enough to move the sealant. So you will not be able to use aero seal to completely 100% seal the duct. You have to have a little bit of air movement. So in general, that means you probably can't get the leakage, say, on a residence down below 20 CFM of leakage. But 20 CFM on a 2,000 CFM system is really, really low and certainly lower than almost any manual sealing method you could probably do. Um, but that's a good point, Dan. You can't 100% seal it down because you won't have – you have to have air moving in order to seal it. You can't have air moving if everything's plugged shut. Um, but you can get down lower than you'd be able to get with hand sealing with mastic. Uh, Walter asks, how much pressure is aero seal good for? I'm not quite sure the tone of your question, Walter. If you're asking, like, can you use it commercially uh, as well? Uh, and the answer is yes. Typical operating pressures, like for a residential system, um, we'll operate the fan anywhere from the, you know, 0.1 inch of static that we need to operate it at for the duct blast test and 25 pascals. Uh, we'll ramp that all the way up to... 600 pascals, which is a little over two inches uh, for a residence. Uh, it's about as high as we go on a residential aero seal duct sealing process. But commercially, we can seal ducts that are higher than that. And if you have systems that are really large, what they do sometimes is they'll break them into smaller pieces in order to seal the duct work. Even if you have duct work, you know, that's designed for three inches of static, you don't necessarily have to seal it at that rate. Um, you can seal it at a lower pressure and still operate it at that higher rate. Um, if you have a specific project that you want to talk about, Walter, let me know, and I'll see if I can get answers for you from the AeroSeal folks on that, or 
connect you with them so they can talk to you directly. Uh, in regards to our poll question, I'm going to go ahead and close that. Looks like pretty much everybody got it right. A, C, D, and E are all correct answers. The only one that is an incorrect answer would be mask tape. Uh, you cannot use mask tape as a permanent sealing mechanism. We use the mask tape to block off registers temporarily when we test duct pressures, but we do not use it for sealing ducts themselves. All right. A couple more slides here. Uh, last two, two or three slides. Um, so just a comparison of, of aerosol versus uh, mastic applications. Um, there's nothing wrong with either one, and obviously if you have really high pressure systems, you might be doing welding and stuff like that. The nice thing about aerosol is it's easy to do after you already have all the ductwork installed and drywalls up and all that stuff. So it's a great retrofit solution if you want to seal duct systems down because you're sealing it from the inside out, not from the outside in. Uh, you can seal things you can't see, things ducts that are butted up against walls, it'll still seal that kind of stuff. Uh, and you get the leakage rates pretty low, typically below 5% leakage. Uh, like I said, on a residence, it's pretty common that you get it down under 40 CFM of total leakage. And prob probably between 15 and 40 is kind of your range of, of, of your goal when all is said and done. Um, takes more time to do seal by hand, um, but it, you know, it might be a little bit less expensive in terms of material, but it takes more time in terms of labor. And to give you an idea, here's my house that when I sealed it a little over a year ago, um, my house is only 12 years old, so you'd think it would have reasonably tight ductwork. Uh, and it did. It was not too bad compared to some of the houses I've seen after that. I thought my house was crappy. Then I saw some other houses, and mine was pretty good. Um, in my case, on this report here, it's supply duct, return duct, and outside air duct all combined. I had 425 CFM leakage, which may or may not sound like a lot to you, but on a three-ton air conditioning system, that's a third of my air right? It, it, it's, it's one ton of my three ton system. And if I tell it to you in terms of how big is the equivalent hole, if I add up all the little tiny pinhole cracks, it was an 81 inch square hole. It's an eight by 10 hole somewhere in my duct that was connected to the outdoors, right? When we're all said and done, we got the leakage down to 45 CFM. As you can see by the graph on the right, it took about a half an hour. And if I was more patient and stayed another 15, 20 minutes, I probably could have got it lower. Um, it was an 89% reduction in leakage. You can see it's tested at 25 pascals, like we normally do for duct systems, residentially speaking. And uh, it corresponded to about a 25% improvement in my overall system capacity. That reduction in leakage uh, improved my three-ton capacity system. By the way, I said 425 is not too bad. Uh, I've had one house on a five-ton system that was 1,400 CF. Actually, on a four-ton system, that was 1,400 CFM of leakage. For you guys that are math whizzes, a four-ton system is about 1,600 CFM. So 1,400 of the 1,600 CFM was not coming out this guy's registers. And it's not the only house we've had like that. We've had several that were that bad. So um, a lot of houses are horrible. Uh, there is some money available to do this. There's not any rebates on the commercial side, although if you had a big project, you could do a custom rebate, if you would. Um, but residentially, uh, there are some rebates for doing duct sealing. Uh, and the methods are agnostic. They don't care if you do mastic or if you do tape or if you do uh, aero seal. Uh, but what they do want you to do and they do require you to do is actually test it. So they don't care how you sealed it as long as you sealed it with a code safe way. But then you have to actually test it. Um, so in terms of people's gas and North Shore gas here in Illinois, um, that rebate is $2 per CFM of reduction. And you got to test it at 25 pascals before and after. So if you reduced it by 100 CFM, you would get a $200 rebate. In my case, I reduced it by almost 400 CFM, so I guess I could get an almost $800 rebate, although the max is 500, so you get 500. In most cases, a lot of these ones you can max out at the 500 pretty easily. Uh, in order to be allowed to do this for people's in North Shore Gas, you have to be listed on the Code Diagnostic website, and there's special training you have to do for that, which I'll mention in a minute. Uh, for you guys on the border in Indiana over there, NIPSCO, um, there is a rebate up to $400 for duct sealing there. Right, so similar kind of program. On the Nightcore side, there's a rebate of up to $350 for duct sealing. The only little weird about the Nightcore one is it's not applicable to all contractors. Only contractors enrolled in the program uh, can do the duct sealing, and you have to be a contractor that does duct sealing, air sealing, insulation, everything. Uh, but for homeowners, you can get $350 bucks there. And on the Nightcore side, you can also do it, you can finance that on your bill along with your furnace improvements and boiler changes and whatever else. You can finance these improvements on your bill at a fairly low rate with no money down, and duct sealing does count for that. 
Uh, for those of you guys that want to learn a little bit more, there's plenty of data out there. I can get you pretty much anything you want. Uh, one article I will point out is out of the ASHRAE Journal. Some of you guys get this magazine. This is from March 2005, which is kind of old now, nine years. But duck technology hasn't really changed in nine years, so it's still an applicable article, and it is pretty good. Uh, there are a few other ASHRAE Journal articles that are newer than that that I could connect you to as well, as well as some other independent data. Uh, for you guys that want more training on duct sealing and testing related type stuff, there's several things going on. Uh, this week in Aurora, there's a certification class um, for residential duct and envelope tightness testing. All right, so if you want to do some of these people's gas type rebates or you want to do code testing, you have to be listed on that website, which means you have to take this class or a similar class. For those of you guys involved in the aerial seal world, uh, I got a class coming up on that. Uh, BPI, um, there's some classes coming up on those, which would include uh, testing of duct systems as well as building envelopes. Um, there's combustion safety testing coming up uh, at our office in Mouse Park. You might wonder why that's involved. Believe it or not, a lot of your combustion air for a atmospherically vented appliance comes into your home via the duct leakage in your attic. So once you seal the duct system in the attic, you may have inadvertently cut back your combustion air, which is a safety issue. So you need to know how to test for these things and then correct them as well. All right, I'm going to launch question number five, which is our final question here. And that's basically just saying whether I'm an idiot or not. Please do not choose that I'm an idiot, even if I may be. Um, if you have any more questions, type them in. I'm going to go read through them right now and see if I can answer some more of them on the fly here. And I would like to thank some of the folks that let me steal their images and slides. Some of them may or may not know that I stole them, but uh, I would like to thank them anyway. All right, let's see if I can answer some more questions. Uh, Tom asks, is there a maximum gap size that AeroSeal can fill? Yeah, Tom, it's basically 5 eighths of an inch is about the biggest gap you could seal. Theoretically, you could seal a bigger gap than that, but the amount of time you have to spend there trying to wait for that to seal would take forever. Uh, it's about 5 eighths of an inch of a gap, which is pretty substantial. Uh, and if anything's bigger than that, really, it's not at that point. It's not. It's not a uh, a gap in the ductwork. It's ductwork that's disconnected. Is how I would think of it. And that ductwork has to be reconnected and fastened with screws and then sealed down. Uh, Joe's asking if AeroSeal is okay. Aeroseal is okay to use on fire dampers and ductwork. That's a good question, Joe. I don't know that answer. We can find that answer out. Um, in terms of like zoning dampers, like control dampers, um, we leave those in when we seal the duct. We obviously open them wide open so air can flow through them. I'm not sure about fire dampers. I've never done a commercial job personally to know that if you can leave the fire dampers in or out. I would think you could probably leave them in, but I don't know that for sure, so we'd want to find that out. Uh, Tom asks, what about fuck? I don't know what that is, Tom, and I probably shouldn't have read that question, so <laughs> we'll look at that one later. Uh, oh, he reworded his question. What about duct in a slab? Much better. Uh, I'm assuming you're asking in regards to aero seal. Um, you can seal duct in a slab. There's no problem with that. However, you can only seal it to prevent air leakage. If you have a water intrusion problem in your slab duct system, which several people have that kind of problem and they think that duct sealing is their solution, it is probably not a good idea. For one, if you have water intrusion in there, puddled standing water will break AeroSeal's glue material down, right? So the, the seal will be gone after time anyway. Additionally, if I got water leaking into my duct and I try to seal this duct up, and I, let's say I do a really awesome job and I seal it up 99% of the way, and still 1% of the way that water's leaking in, and now it has less waste to get back out. So sealing ductwork in a slab is fine as long as you don't have a water problem. If you got a water problem, not a good idea. Of course, those are the people that are calling you probably. Uh, Mark asks if aerial seal can work on homes that use joist spaces at returns. The answer is yes. Uh, you can seal um, building cavity returns uh, with an aerial seal system. I've done that several times in the past. Um, I've twice had situations where I could not seal it because it was too leaky. So like, for example, that system I mentioned that was four tons with 1400 CFM of leakage. That was 1400 CFM leakage on the return side only, right? So basically there was no return duct. The holes in the duct were as big as the actual duct itself. End caps ended up being missing, so you can't seal that kind of stuff. But if it's just air leaking through the wall cavity because somebody ran the cable wire through this hole and somebody ran the, you know, this wire through that hole, um, then, yeah, you can seal that with, with aero seal. 
Uh, but if there's if there's missing pieces of ductwork and there's no top plates up at the attic or there's no end caps on the ductwork, then you would not be able to do so. John asks if testing with uniform 25 pascals, you have 520 CFM leakage. Would system have this much leak loss if normal operation was 25 pascals max and less at most leak locations? Um, so I think what you're trying to do, John, is correlate the leakage that you have tested at 25 pascals to a normal operating condition. So a, a quote-unquote normal furnace is probably operating at a half inch of static, which is more like 150 pascals. So the pressures that we test duct systems at are typically uh, lower than what we operate them at. And if I was to increase the operating pressure from 25 pascals to something higher, my leakage rate of CFM would increase. My pressure differential would be higher, so air would leak out faster through the same size holes. Hopefully that answers it. Uh, Larry asks if NICOR offers a rebate. The answer is yes, Larry. The rebate is $350 per system sealed, uh, but you do have to use certain contractors to do that particular program as it stands today. Uh, Charles actually asked if uh, on my own house, when I did aero seal on it uh, last year, if I was able to notice a difference. Yes, I had two zones that were particularly problematic. One was my home office, and the other one was my bedroom above the garage, which is my youngest kid's bedroom, which is always constantly cold. All winter long, and even this summer, uh, that bedroom was significantly more comfortable, immeasurably more comfortable, two degrees more comfortable when I measured it with my thermal gun. My office did not improve at all, though, and I still had restricted, reduced airflow there. I've since taken my duct work apart to realize why that happened and what was obstructing my duct. So I don't blame that one on the duct leakage. But the one above the garage, yes, that problem was solved with my ceiling at my house. And I already had a zoning system, by the way, which also helps bonus rooms above garages, if you will. Uh, but the duct ceiling did make a big improvement there. Additionally, and I argued with the aero seal guys about this a year and a half ago, because uh, all my duct works inside the condition envelope. So my argument to them was, F you, I'm not going to save any actual energy because all my leakage now goes into my house. It doesn't go outside, so there's no money to be saved. And they said, no, 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 Ryan. What will happen is you'll get the air in coming out the registers into the rooms that you care about finally that you never had before. So what you'll do is you'll stop overcompensating your thermostat, and after a couple days, you'll end up walking over your thermostat, and you'll change the set point on the stat by a couple degrees to be comfortable again. I said, no way. Uh, I sealed my house in August. I totally forgot about it when the furnace season came in October. My wife was like, what the F did you do to the thermostat? It's roasting hot in here. So now instead of keeping our stat at 69, we keep our stat at 67. We literally dropped to two degrees in the uh, in the winter. I did not change it in the summer. I'm not sure why that is a difference, but it definitely made a difference in the heating season. Uh, Sam asked to show the graph of my own house. Something so you can send letters to my house because you love me or you want to send me a case of beer and want my address, that's fine too. Um, Jordan asks roughly how long does the aerosol process take in a typical home? Uh, as you can see from my graph here, the actual ceiling only took 30 minutes, although sometimes it takes a little over an hour. But the process is typically going to be five to seven hours for setting all this stuff up, doing a pre-test, doing a post-test. But the actual ceiling is really quick. Uh, Thomas asks, what are the costs involved in buying an aero seal system? So I'm assuming not sealing your own house, but actually buying a system to do it. Uh, I do not know what that is. Uh, we can find out. Um, send me a note, and I'll be happy to help anybody with that. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to put, if you guys don't already have my email, I'm going to type it into the note thing here and send it to everybody. So if anybody had any pending questions they want to send me, uh, they'll see that in the chat box down there. Um, I don't know what the exact cost is, Thomas. I know it's tens of thousands of dollars to buy all the equipment because it's not just the aero seal machine. You have to have, you know, compressed air. You have to have air dryers. Um, so there's other equipment involved too. Um, generators typically to run the equipment. Uh, so it's tens of thousands of dollars, but I can find out exactly. I'll, I can connect you with someone who sells aero seal and they can tell you about it. All right, I think I got all the questions uh, answered, I believe. So with that, um, if anybody has any final questions, uh, email them to me or call me on the phone. Um, or since my address is up on the screen, you can send me a letter via U.S. mail. Um, and then you can uh, I'll try to answer the questions for you. All right. Thank you guys for your time. I appreciate it.